Hi, I'm back again with Kari Rollins, and she's here talking with me today about data breach incident response as the Sedona Conference recommends how organizations should respond to such incidents. And we're talking in this third part segment about what to do after an uh, incident has been reported. So, Carrie, uh, please tell me what the initial issues are that come to mind when you get that phone call from a client sure. that says something happened. Sure. So, um, usually, as, as we were talking about in the prior segment, you may not know whether you've had a breach as defined by law. Um, you are just told by your information security team or an employee or a manager that you've had, uh, there's been an attack or there's been, I can't get, I can't get access to my email, my, my account's frozen. So you immediately start to investigate. You want your, per, according to your incident response plan, which we'll hopefully have in place, um, you'll convene your incident response team. You'll start to investigate mm -hmm. under privilege. You'll call, if you need to, your outside forensic in investigator to help you assess, <laughs> help you assess um, what's happened, right? Mm -hmm. the, the facts in an incident are really, really important because mm -hmm. they drive the legal conclusions. Have you had a breach or have you had an incident that um, has resulted in the acquisition or just the access to personally protected information? Mm -hmm. Or are you? Or did you have an incident where maybe the systems that house the personal information were accessed, but there's no evidence that the the malware ever made it into mm -hmm. the the fam, you know yep. the, the the room where the family jewels are hidden and they were taken out? And that's an important part of understanding whether you actually have a legal obligation to notify regulatory authorities or consumers. Mm -hmm. um, so. First step is always convening the team, putting mm -hmm. it under privilege, calling your experts, and starting to investigate the important facts. Yeah. Was this an outside threat? Was it an inside threat? Mm -hmm. I know you've had experience a lot with investigating internal threats, which are on the rise these days, yeah. as I would well, expect. In, in, in a lot of these incidents, it might be reported as a data breach, and the question is, well, how did it happen? And sometimes it's not too uncommon that IT staff don't receive the resources they request, and that data incidents happen as a result of being under-resourced. Right. And in circumstances like that, there's still a lot of pressure on the people managing IT to not only run the organization ongoing, but to deal with this whole new layer of, of trouble. So having, having that team in place beforehand where those relationships are there really helps. Yeah. And um, the other thing too is, you know, if there is, a failure internally, it's more difficult and less likely that you're going to get the facts quickly if you're using the team responsible in some way for the breach to report on what happened. Yeah. Um, I always recommend that you know after that initial meeting that preservation of key data right. occurs and is offloaded outside the organization. You know log files, um, certain key computers. Uh, email systems to the extent that they were modified right. so that there's ability to do that analysis because when an organization has an incident it's quite possible that all the, the data disappears in an effort to cover the, the tracks. Or it's it's not even, it may not be as nefarious as that. It yeah. could be that um, the teams are working so quickly a lot of the remediation plans are to um, you know, thwart the malware and to remove yeah. it. But in a lot of instances, you need to safely remove it and keep a copy of it because you need to, may need to reverse engineer it and mm -hmm. understand how it got there, yeah. understand other signatures it might have. So being thoughtful, and we talk about this, being thoughtful about evidence pre preservation mm -hmm. is really critical, especially if you get to the point at which you do have a breach that requires notification yeah. and litigation or regulatory inquiry ensues. You will have been expected to preserve that evidence and show the chain of custody. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you, you could have allegations of spoliation leveled against yeah. your company. And I, I've seen circumstances too where a legitimate data incident happens and we're able to get in quickly and identify the impacted individuals and sometimes it's just been a few people and in, in a circumstance like that it's much easier to reach out to those individuals make things right and, and resolve the issue and be able to report to them what happened it's much better than having to publish on your your website and report yeah. to the attorney general that you had some massive data breach so not all data incidences are massive data breaches that's true some of them impact you know one or two individuals and you may still have an obligation to notify them under the relevant law 
um, but they don't have to be, be the big massive breaches. And again, I think the great thing about the Sedona Conference Guide is that it's you know, it helps companies navigate small to big breaches. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not intended to be the ultimate authority on the law in this area because the law is ever changing. Mm -hmm. But what it does is it helps companies issue spot from a practical, practical perspective so that they know what laws they need mm -hmm. to consult and why and what issues they need to address, like, for example, um, notifying your insurance carrier. Mm -hmm. one, of, one of the big questions we always get is, well, we're the victims here. The company X is a victim of this cyber attack. Mm -hmm. Who's going to pay for it? Yeah. Um, and, and so insurance coverage for cyber incidents has, uh, is a really hot button issue these days. And so it's important for companies to know in advance what their policies say, what the mm -hmm. notification requirements are. even if they just have a sniff of an incident, maybe it's not a breach, so that the third party and first party costs are mm -hmm. covered and that you're working with your insurance carrier and you're working with your insurance counsel um, to ensure that coverage and to make sure that you're getting the right information to your insurance carrier about your forensic mm -hmm. teams. Are they approved? Um, at what rate are they going to be reimbursed? Um, mm -hmm. What type of reporting do you have to do from a cost and expense perspective to yeah. your insurance carrier? So. And, and is it true that if companies use their own internal IT resources to do the investigation, that the insurance carriers usually won't pay out their own internal resources? It really depends. It, depends it, really, on the it really depends on the policy. Um, there are, you know, in some instances, some policies would cover. The first party um, staffing costs. So, mm -hmm. for example, if you had to pay staff overtime to work 24 hours a day to try and investigate, yeah. you may be able to claim that. But it really depends yeah. on your policy. Um, there's certain there are, there are certain certainly reimbursement line items for um, business disruption mm -hmm. and business interruption. Um, or you know, loss of business, mm -hmm. lost profits, line items so yeah. as a result of ransomware attacks. But again, knowing your mm -hmm. policy is a critical step in preparing. What, what do you see the benefits of using an outside <laughs> forensic investigators as opposed to internal IT to investigate when an uh, incident happens? You know, I think it's it's twofold. Um, one, a lot of the internal IT teams are taxed as it is mm -hmm. with their day-to-day -day obligations. And if an incident is one that's you know medium high critical, you want to be able to dedicate the resources to the incident to investigate swiftly mm -hmm. and and to ensure that there's no delay. And so pulling in a third party um, forensic expert alleviates some of that yeah. burden and stress on the IT teams. And then se separately and secondly, um, it also creates a level of objectivity mm -hmm. that is that benefits the company in the event or in the unfortunate event someone in the IT group may have made a mistake that yeah. caused the vulnerability um, there's less likelihood that um, that mistake would be covered up or you know there's going to be more candor from the third party expert to the mm -hmm. management team to say like hey this issue should have been addressed and it wasn't and now you know, you know what the warts may be in the event. You yeah. have some litigation down the road and you need to defend. But um, so I would say really sort of you know, time and devotion of resources um, where needed and objectivity. Great. Well, thanks a bunch for being on the show. This was great. Absolutely. Thank you.